Good morning, friends. Happy Sabbath and welcome to the Piedmont Park Seventh-day Adventist Church online Sabbath school lesson discussion. I am Pat Barber and with me and leading our discussion is Pastor Ray Daniel. Good morning, Pastor Ray. We've had quite a momentous morning, haven't we? Good morning. <laughs> uh, friends, thank you so much for your uh, patience with us. Uh, last week was we weren't able, uh, we were switching Zoom and there was a lot of uh, things that were changing. And so because of some technical difficulties related to that, we weren't able to broadcast our uh, lesson three uh, last week. Uh, Pastor Ray is contemplating having us record that and at least it'd be available on YouTube for you if we do that. Uh, but today is lesson four to stay in sync with uh, the quarterly uh, for us today. And so uh, before we uh, dive into this wonderful, wonderful lesson, we'd like to ask the Lord to uh, bless it. One thing I'll say before we start into this, though, we've laid, John has uh, with these this quarterly, uh, we have studied, uh, some groundwork has been laid. We have studied the divinity of Christ. John has already established uh, the divine nature of our dear Jesus, dear Savior Jesus. And he also uh, established that Jesus was before there was anything. And so those are two of the points we've already covered the great I am's. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world and all of the other I am's. So he's, and he's presented us with some miracles that Jesus uh, had performed. And uh, as we said back at the beginning, 60% of the material that we're covering in John is only in John. Some of this is in other places, but most of this is only covered by John. And so today then we are continuing that and we're continuing the witnesses. He wanted to uh, establish that because remember now we've talked about this, that this is a study that the book of John is for all of us that didn't see Jesus personally. You know, it's, he's telling us how to have a relationship with someone we can't see, feel, or touch. We aren't walking the dusty roads of Damascus with or, or Galilee with Jesus. So he's saying to us that we can have just as real or even more so, per, not maybe not more so, but we can have a very real relationship with him because he's pointing out all these things. And of course he left us with a helper, the Holy Spirit. So let's ask him then to join, uh, to bless this study as we dive into witnesses of Christ as the Messiah. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, Father God, for your great mercy and your blessings and your compassions upon us. Dear Father, as we open this lesson, we know that uh, that it has some very, very valuable lessons for us to learn. Father, as we study these lessons, we are reminded that we aren't uh, just wanting to impart information. Father, we want these lessons to be imbued with your Holy Spirit so as to be transformational within our lives. Mm -hmm. Dear Father, we thank you for them. We thank you, Father, for... Uh, the scholars that have written these lessons for us. Dear Father, before we open the lesson, though, we ask that you would remember each person that is in our prayer box, that you would bless them, that you would uh, intervene in the way that you know best for each of them, bless their families as well, and bless, Father, we pray a special blessing upon each person that's going to be tuning in to this, uh, to these lessons, and particularly this, this one. Thank you, Father God. Bless this lesson. We ask that you would quiet the noise of the week, that we would then be able to concentrate on what you have for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So, Pastor Ray, I'll turn it over to you then for you to bring up the lesson study for us. Okay. Do we see it? You don't see it yet. You don't see it. Yeah. Do not see it. Okay. Okay. 
How about now? There it is. We see it and we see you. you got it. <laughs> All right. Well, very good. We're back in business. We're back in business. All right. As you mentioned, uh, the uh, theme is witnesses of Christ as the Messiah. We find our memory text from the encounter of Jesus with one of these witnesses, Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is what he said to Nicodemus. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, John 3. Well, uh, as we see, no question, uh, Jesus provided people with powerful scriptural evidence to back up the claims that he had been making about himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he says um, that if you um, understand that uh, and believe on me, you'll have everlasting life. Uh, mm -hmm. He showed some other powerful examples of who he was, as we've seen in the previous lessons of miracles that he did, turning water to wine and the feeding of the thousands with the few loaves of bread and healing the nobleman's son, restoring the man at the pool of Bethesda, uh, uh, giving sight to a, a blind man who had been blind from birth and the, and the crowning one raising Lazarus from the dead. So uh, he calls on a variety of events and people uh, Jew, Gentile, rich, poor, male, female, rulers, commoners, educated, uneducated, uh, to bear witness to who Jesus is. It's quite a plethora of witnesses. Uh, yes. On our trip to California that we had just came back from a few days ago, um, our little granddaughter Zoe um, was at the table and one of our relatives, uh, several of our relatives had joined us for a meal, our California relatives. Uh, one of them was an attorney, and, uh, and he heard me ask Zoe this question. I said, Zoe, what did you see? And Zoe said, nothing. I said, what did you see? Nothing. And she wouldn't change her answer. It was always just nothing. So I asked the attorney relative, I said, would you like to put her on the witness stand <laughs> as an eyewitness and say, what did you see? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, nothing. <laughs> that wouldn't help much, would it? No, it would not. <laughs> but if we ask these individuals what they saw, uh, they clearly witnessed who Jesus was and they weren't afraid to tell it. Um, and John also points to the witness of the Father himself, uh, to the witness of Scripture, all of these giving evidence of who Jesus was. So uh, the lesson begins uh, with the powerful witness of John the Baptist, and then other witnesses come along uh, behind that. Uh, but there's another witness back in the shadows. Uh, it's the other disciple that was with Andrew. John himself, and he certainly was a witness. Uh, yes. So um, we moved on on Sunday to the testimony of John the Baptist. Uh, the gospel of John begins with Jesus Christ, the word in his eternal existence before creation. You mentioned that a moment ago. Uh, but in that same prologue, John the Baptist appears as a witness to Jesus himself. Um, some Jews in Jesus' time expected two messiahs, interestingly enough. One they expected to be priestly and the other royal. Mm -hmm. But John clearly teaches that John the Baptist did not claim to be one of these messiahs, but was a witness to the one true messiah. They asked him uh, who he was. Who are you? And he confessed, I am not the Christ. He just denied it. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, what then? Are, are you Elijah? Now, why are they asking that? Because they believed Elijah was to come, you know, in, in the last days. Right. And he said, no, I'm not. 
Are you the prophet? He answered, no. They said, well, who are you uh, that we can tell those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? Well, I, said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Mm -hmm. So the question was asked, well, how did he explain his ministry and mission? He, he said, I'm just a voice. I'm, That's right. I'm there to prepare the way for the Messiah. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. He was not the light. He was sent from God to bear witness to the light and prepare for the coming of the Messiah. And so this is the man sent from God whose name was John. Uh, mm -hmm. He came mm -hmm. for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light. And he recognized it. He clearly recognized it and denied uh, being anything else. He was mm -hmm. sent to bear witness of that light. And so he could he could plainly say, I am not the Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, and, no. and you, yes, and you know, Pastor Ray, uh, we see a very, a lot of humility here with John. Uh, he understood that he was the messenger, not the message. Uh, the message was Christ, you know, was going to be our, uh, uh, the Messiah, uh, Christ. But John recognized that he, he truly understood his role and he stayed focused, laser focused uh, on his role. I mean, uh, one thought was there was a saying in the 70s, the, the main thing, the main thing is the main thing. Mm -hmm. And then Steve and Stephen Covey actually has that sort of incorporated in his the seven habits of successful people or, or something like that. Right. But John understood the main thing was for him to uh, go before, to make, uh, he was a voice crying in the wilderness. He was to prepare the way for the Messiah. And he really never veered from that. Looking at that from a human perspective, though, you would think, you know, here it is, these two cousins, they're cousins that were born very close together and uh, time frame wise. And uh, one whose sole role in life was to talk about and build up the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, you think about that with, you know, in, in our own the family dynamics in which we live today. And uh, there's a lot of rivalry that occurs uh, in some families. It's not true mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of those kinds of things playing in there. So you can just imagine how close John needed to stay to the Lord in order to fulfill his role. And I think that that's true for us too. Our role as Seventh-day Adventists is to um, prepare the way for the Savior, you know, for our, our the Messiah. We are to, uh, and we're gonna uh, develop that theme a little bit more as we go on into our lesson uh, here today uh, in various ways. But I remember the song, one last comment, from the Seventh-day Adventist hymnal, not I, but Christ. That's and I'll right. just say one little one little part of it. it says, not I, but Christ be honored, loved, exalted. Not I, but Christ be seen, be known, be heard. Not I, but Christ in every look and action. Not I, but Christ in every thought and word. And it goes on and, uh, you know, with uh, three, two, two more verses, and then the chorus, of course, is uh, Christ only Christ, no idle words air falling, Christ only Christ, no needless bustling sound. And it just goes on with that idea. And that was something of how John lived his life from start to finish. That's right. That's right. Um, I think there's a lesson for us as witnesses. And that is... Um, it's possible for someone we are witnessing to, to become enamored with us. Yes, that's right. Uh, it's also possible for an individual to become enamored with a pastor, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a personality. And, uh, and they're more uh, attached to them or to us than to what we're teaching them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we can't afford to let that happen. Uh, no, no. 
be sure that we have him as the focus of what we mm -hmm. share. Um, and and uh, and and uh, freely admit we're not the thing that they need to be interested in. It's, mm -hmm. him. it's him. That's right. That's right. That's that's what John uh, did. Um, another distinction uh, that John made uh, that that uh, he had baptized with water, but he said Christ would baptize with the Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, and he says in uh, John 1 33, I did not know him. His cousin, he didn't know him, but, but that's mm -hmm. what he says. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said, upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And then mm -hmm. he went on to say, I'm not even worthy to loosen Jesus' sandal strap. Mm -hmm. uh, Christ was preferred before John because he was before John. That's right. And John recognized that. Jesus mm -hmm. was the son of God and John was merely pointing to him. Um, Isaiah spoke of this witness, this voice crying in the wilderness in chapter 40. Uh, a voice coming along, crying out, comfort. Comfort my people, speak comfort. Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Mm -hmm. And John said, I'm that one. I, I am the one that has been sent, as Isaiah had said. So how does John use these verses from Isaiah to, to describe his mission? And uh, it's describing things the way they were back in that day, the, the rutted and rock-filled roads that they traveled on. And servants were sometimes sent ahead uh, of the king to level the surfaces of the roadways and to take out sharp turns and so forth, a very important role that they played. And, uh, and John is saying, I'm like that. I, I'm the one preparing the way of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We certainly have um, a different uh, situation today. Uh, we have much better roads, and yet they have to be repaired too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we've seen a lot of that going on in Lincoln in the last number of months. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, some very rough roads that are being resurfaced, and uh, I'm glad that we have... Uh, those still doing that work of preparing the way for us so that we can travel over them in a much smoother manner. Um, well, we're asked in what way should we as Seventh-day Adventists do the same kind of ministry as John the Baptist? Uh, what are the parallels? Well, uh, we are to prepare for the second coming. That's our mission. That's right. And the parallel is we're just the voice preparing the way just like he was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, we looked uh, at another description of Jesus on Monday as the Lamb of God. Uh, the Hebrew nation was looking for a Messiah who would deliver them from Rome, uh, not a gentle lamb. Uh, <laughs> the goal of the Gospel of John was to change their understanding of the Messiah so that they could recognize in Jesus the fulfillment of the prophecies regarding the coming king, because uh, he was not going to be an earthly ruler. He was going to fulfill all the Old Testament promises, and uh, that included the sacrificing himself for the benefit of the world. Um, so that's why John recognized Jesus as this, as this lamb, he saw him coming. He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Wow. Mm -hmm. so, so what proclamation does he make? That, that he is the Lamb of God who is going to take away sin. And mm -hmm. uh, what is the image he uses to depict him? Uh, a lamb. A lamb. Mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. Used to describe his mission to die like the lambs had been dying for hundreds of years as sacrifices. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the statement of John the Baptist regarding him being a lamb uh, supports the purpose of his gospel to bring about a renewed understanding of the work and nature of the Messiah. 
uh, he would indeed be the fulfillment of the promise of the sacrificial system that went all the way back to Genesis 3.15 uh, when the uh, seed of the woman would, uh, would be bruised. Well, when at the baptism of Jesus, John pointed to him as the Lamb of God, a new light was shed upon the Messiah's work, and the prophet's mind was directed to the words of Isaiah, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, Pastor Ray, uh, you know, this took me back to uh, Genesis 22, verse 7, when Isaac says to uh, his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, he says, uh, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And then the idea is that uh, he's asking the question that people continue to ask through the ages of where is the lamb? And finally, John then tells us, then uh, uh, he points to Jesus and when he says, behold the lamb. So this mm -hmm. is the lamb, capital L, lamb here. Mm -hmm. This is not, this is going to end all of these recurring lamb, uh, sacrificial um, uh, 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 killings that was going to have to uh, sacrifices that was going to have to occur uh, when he says my God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offerings and that's 22 verse 8 I think and in the ram and this is from desire of ages and in the ram divinely provided in the place of Isaac Abraham saw a symbol of him who was to die for the sins of men men the Holy Spirit, through Isaiah, taking up the illustration prophesied of the Savior, as you said just a moment ago, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of all of us. And so when we think about that, that that question was, and that that's not a question that would need to be answered anymore, uh, because it was answered in the embodiment of Christ, sacrificing himself on the cross for each one of us. That's the slaughter. And slaughter is a very harsh word to think of. But as we studied in Mark, in last quarter's lessons, we studied, we touched on the harshness of that sacrifice. Oh, yes, yes. Well, when you're talking about slaughter, I think I may have mentioned this before, but um, Bonnie, my wife, was um, raised on a farm up in North Dakota where she saw slaughtering going on of animals, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but still was a meat eater until she came here to College View Academy and they took a field trip to the slaughterhouse in Omaha. Mm -hmm. uh, and when mm -hmm. she saw what actually was done to these animals, uh, she came back from that determined not to eat any more of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and uh, that definitely changed her uh, view of things. Well, mm -hmm. uh, we looked at some passages that help us understand that that was his mission. Uh, Mark 10 says, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to give his life a mm -hmm. ransom. Uh, Romans 5 says, uh, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And First Peter says, he bore our sins in his body on the tree. Uh, his stripes healed us. So how do these verses help us understand the role of Jesus as the Lamb of God, that, that he is the true sacrificial lamb represented by all the previous sacrifices? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And however much John needed to learn uh, more than he knew at the time, uh, he was certain Jesus was the promised Messiah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we were asked to consider deeply uh, Jesus' title as the Lamb of God and what images it brings to mind and, and how that links with the Old Testament sacrificial system uh, in a way that helps us appreciate the, the price of our salvation. Well, the image it brings to mind uh, are are the bloody sacrifice of these of these lambs mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that just um grosses you out to to see that actually happening to see these animals being 
slaughtered to, to visualize that mm -hmm. and and for the uh individual to have to bring this lamb to the uh, to be sacrificed and then to cut its throat themselves oh my lands uh, yeah yeah uh, aren't you thankful we don't have to do that anymore <laughs> i'm i'm so so grateful oh, my. but you know god in god in his his great wisdom knew that by participating because it would they would have perhaps viewed it the, the way we would today and that is you take it he takes it and he does something that the, the uh, priest does something with it but you are not really participating you've just given it and then you're done you know mm -hmm. that's it but by you having to slit the throat of that lamb your participation then gave you some uh, knowledge and gave you perhaps a, a different kind of a perspective and realization of or dawning on what this actually meant. You're doing it to this animal, but to think then of this happening to our savior, you know, and to think that over all those centuries, all that time, all those lambs that had to be sacrificed, and then you have this one savior do it, one one and so you can just imagine if it took that many lambs over all that time and then one savior to stop all of that but with sac his sacrifice is for all for all for all and th to me that is just a, a very um uh, incredible thing to even think about that yes. his shed blood, we know that life is in the blood. That's what it tells us in Leviticus. And mm -hmm. so his shed blood then would uh, make null and void the need for any more lambs to be shed. Not that you have a great love for lambs, don't dislike them, but you know, it's not the same as our dear savior who went about healing, the one that we can talk to when we have issues the one we can call upon before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. When we, this savior, that that one, or the one who ever intercedes on our behalf. So when we think about all that Jesus does, that he did this too. It's just pretty remarkable. It is, it is. Well, um, we moved on on Tuesday to these two disciples of John. Uh, they happened to be standing there with John when Jesus walked by and John made the statement, behold, the Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. And um, what did they do? They they walked away from John. Yeah. He Jesus. He lost two mm -hmm. disciples on the spot. Uh, because they recognized that Jesus was greater than John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to be connected with him. And uh, they saw him as the fulfillment of John's message. Um, well, what did the two disciples do after hearing John's witness? They, they left John to follow Jesus. They, they wanted to be with him. Um, and they spent the day with him. Who knows what amazing things they had learned and experienced that day. Uh, they must have been great things because before long, their desire was to share their experience with others. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, one of them immediately found his brother, Simon, uh, which we call Peter, who became mm -hmm. such a key figure in the New Testament. Uh, and he says, we have found the Messiah. Mm -hmm. just translated to Christ. He had no doubt. We, we found him. And when Andrew brought his brother to Jesus, Jesus immediately showed that he knew him. Mm -hmm. said, You're Simon, <laughs> the son of Jonah. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter was shocked. Uh, you know, how does he know me? Mm -hmm. But he says, uh, I know you and, and you're going to be called Cephas. Uh, Jesus knew and understood him already. Uh that Jesus knows a person is a motif of the gospel of John. Yes. Uh, such as uh, John 2, uh, speaking of the uh, church leaders, the Pharisees, Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. And he had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. So um, nobody fooled him. <laughs> That's right. 
That's he, right. He do each person before mm -hmm. they, they ever realize it. Well, if John and Andrew had possessed the unbelieving spirit of the priests and the rulers, uh, they wouldn't have uh, followed Jesus and sat at his feet. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But they uh, they did that. They they wanted to be as close to him as they could. They they responded to the Holy Spirit's call, mm -hmm. and, and now they recognize the voice of the of the heavenly teacher. The mm -hmm. entire emphasis of the Gospel of John is to bring to light who Jesus is, so that this good news may be shared with the world. That's right. That's right. And Pastor Ray, before we move into Wednesday. I wrote down three striking things. I, This is what I wrote. Three striking things that we can learn from these two disciples. One is they received light. They were, you know, it was pointed out to them that this is the Messiah. And they immediately took the light, the truth that was given to them. And they decided I'm going to follow that light. And that's I think right. that's still true for us today. That when God gives us understanding about uh, whatever it happens to be, then we are to take that light and we are to follow it. The second one is they wanted to share this wonderful experience, you know, oh, taste and see is, is, is what I wrote down here. They wanted to share this wonderful, they didn't keep it just to themselves, just like as if they had been healed of being blind or healed of uh, paralysis, you know, the man by the pool, or they felt this was as good as that or better perhaps this is the good news and then the third one is that they wanted to linger in his presence so right. once they knew and in spirit of prophecy in lift him up it says that uh, jesus knew that the disciples were following him they were the first fruits of his ministry and there was joy in the heart of the divine teacher as these souls responded to his grace mm -hmm. yet turning he asked only what seek ye uh, he was going to allow them, you know, to turn back if they so chose to do so. And then they said, they asked him, well, wh where are you, uh, where are you, where dwellest thou? In mm -hmm. other words, where you are is where I want to be. You know, how often have you said that to Bonnie or Bonnie said that to you, that where you are, that's where I want to be. And that's what Christ has always said to us. I want to dwell with you. I want to be with you. And so I just found that very, uh, just pretty wonderful. Amen. Thank you. Well, on Wednesday, we looked at two other individuals, uh, Philip yeah. and Nathaniel. Mm -hmm. uh, in John 1, we see Jesus. Uh, he's, he's going to Galilee, and, and he found Philip there, and, and he said to him, follow me. Mm -hmm. Now, Philip <laughs> was from Bethsaida, uh, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael immediately and said, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. It's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. <laughs> Nathanael said, did anything good come out of this prison? <laughs> yeah. And Philip said, well, come and see. Yeah. So what did Philip's message reveal about his faith in Jesus already? He knew who Jesus was. He was. Mm -hmm. um, and so he wanted Philip to know this. Um, Philip calls Jesus the one Moses and the prophets wrote about. And he adds the name Jesus of Nazareth. And that's what sets off the reaction uh, from his friend. <clears throat> you see, Nathaniel was apparently prejudiced against Nazareth. Uh, and maybe mm -hmm. justifiably so. And uh, prejudice can easily blind the mind and mm -hmm. the eyes. Um, and Philip seems to have recognized that the proper way to deal with prejudice is not some exalted uh, philosophical or theological argumentation, but rather just invite the individual to experience the truth for themselves. Come and see. Mm -hmm. Just come, come and see. see. Check it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or as David says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's right. <laughs> taste and see. Um, so um, that's what Nathaniel did. He went and he, he saw. And Jesus saw him coming. Mm -hmm. And he said to him, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. 
And Samuel said, what? Ah, don't eat. <laughs> mm -hmm. Jesus said, mm -hmm. before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Well, that's all it took for him to know who Jesus was. He said, Rabbi, yeah. you are the son of God. Yeah. You're the king of Israel. Now, that was a quick study. <laughs> I mean, he... <laughs> that was. Uh, he jumped to those conclusions right away. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, uh, is it because I said I saw you under that fig tree? Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to see a lot greater things than these. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to see heaven open. You're going to see the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. You ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. <laughs> but if I were to ask, uh, ask Zoe uh, what she did, saw, I'm sure she would say, Nothing. nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I saw nothing, but but uh, he wouldn't say that. No, uh, Jesus said, you're going to see a lot more. How did Jesus convince Nathaniel uh, who he was? And what was Nathaniel's response to him? By telling him he had seen him before he came. That's right, that he uh, knew his heart. Yeah. His immediate response was, you are the son of God and the king of Israel. Well, mm -hmm. missing between uh, verse 46 and 47 is the crucial detail of just how Nathaniel responded to Philip's invitation. He got up and went to see. Uh, mm -hmm. His friendship with Philip was stronger than his prejudice, and his life would be changed from that moment on. Jesus says nice words about Nathaniel. He calls him an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. What a contrast to what Nathaniel said about Jesus. Can it mm -hmm. could come out of Nazareth? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, a very different uh, attitude. Um, and Nathaniel responds with surprise because he had not met Jesus. Uh, and, and he couldn't believe that Jesus already knew him. Um, but he quickly makes a very exalted confession that Jesus was in fact the Son of God and the King of Israel. Amen. Uh, mm -hmm. We're to note how this seemingly small revelation led to such a grand confession of faith. It was, it was remarkable. We and, came on Thursday. Go ahead. Just, just before we go there, mm -hmm. so what we've just seen here is a couple of methods two methods here. We've seen uh, well, we, we're seeing friendship evangelism is what we are seeing happening here is the term that we use today, you know, in the case where Andrew goes and calls his, you know, tells his brother the good news and say, come, you know, and then in uh, this case where Philip now is inviting his friend, uh, Nathaniel, and uh, we can just see here that uh, what I've written here, or this is coming from the Desire of Ages, it says, if Nathaniel had trusted to the rabbis for guidance, he would never have found Jesus. It was by seeing and judging for himself that he uh, became a disciple. So in the case of many today whom prejudice holds from good, how different would be the result if they would come and see. So we are to not trust anything or anybody out there to study for ourselves and then to taste and see if God is good. That's right. Absolutely. On Thursday, we took a look at another witness. Uh, this was a prominent uh, leader of the Jews called Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee. Um, and he was wanting to talk to Jesus, check things out uh, with him, himself personally, and, but he didn't want anybody to know it. Um, this would not be a good thing if his contemporaries no. in Lee no. knew that he had done this. So he came by night to Jesus and uh, he wanted to um, talk with him about who he was. And he, he says, we know you're a teacher come from God, uh, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. He was very impressed with all those miracles and so forth that we've been studying about. Uh, he saw them and he believed that Jesus was some something very special. Um, so Jesus was flattered by that uh, praise and said, thank you so much. I'm glad to 
know that <laughs> recognize how great I am and so forth. Mm -hmm. No, I can't say that. Uh, he said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What? <laughs> how does that relate to... Uh, to Nicodemus' introduction, it, it's just a total contrast. Jesus didn't mess around. Mm -mm. Uh, mm -mm. I spent some time uh, the other day with an individual at his doctor's appointment. And uh, when the doctor walked in, he immediately got to the point, to the issues at hand. Mm -hmm. He didn't mess around. He wanted to know this. He wanted to know that. It was a quite a young doctor. But boy, did he know his stuff, and uh, and and he was so direct. Uh, he he didn't want to chit chat. He just went right to the points and asked him this and asked him that, and and uh, that's what Jesus did with Nicodemus. He just got right mm -hmm. to the point. He said, "You can't mm -hmm. you can't uh, uh, enter the kingdom. You can't even see it unless you're born." <laughs> so Nicodemus right. was was shocked. He, mm -hmm. And and he tried to defend himself uh, because he recognized he was talking to him about this. He said, well, how, how is that possible? How, how can a man be be born when he's old? Can you go back into his mother's womb and be born again? What are you talking about? <clears throat> Jesus didn't let up. He said, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't marvel that I say you must be born again. Uh, the wind blows and you hear it and so forth, but you can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going. And that's the same way with the spirit. So Nicodemus uh, wanted to know, um, how can these things be? Mm -hmm. and Jesus said, are you a teacher of Israel and you don't know <laughs> these things? <laughs> That's insulting. Yeah. I mean, uh, it 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 really was a, a rather insulting remark to him. But he wanted to uh, confront him with the fact that he should he should understand that. Um, <clears throat> and he says, uh, "If I tell told you earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things?" Mm -hmm. So, if you're wanting to know these special things. Uh, you need to get with it. You 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 need to to gain some understanding. So he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the most incredible verses in the Bible are found in this passage, in this encounter with Nicodemus, uh, that night visit, uh, including the, the most wonderful text in the Bible, God so loved the world, mm. and he gave his only begotten son, John 3, 16, that mm. occurred during this visit, and yes. Jesus, God did not send his son to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, mm -hmm. so we're mm -hmm. How does the testimony of Nicodemus support the theme of the Gospel of John? Well, uh, he sees him as sent from God. John, mm -hmm. I mean, Nicodemus recognizes that he is a, a person who's been sent from God. Uh, but even before Nicodemus realized what he was doing, he was giving evidence in support of the Messiahship of Jesus speaking of all the miracles that he had seen and so forth, the signs. And and he viewed those signs as evidence of Jesus' divine calling, but but he didn't see them as pointing to him as as a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies regarding the Messiah. Uh, he came with some doubt. Uh, he didn't yet recognize Jesus as the Christ. And so Jesus uh, had to bring him around to understanding that. That's right. That's right. And what did he do to do that? He he just he just uh, confronted him with with this with this message. You must be born born again. 
And you know, Pastor Ray, this is kind of re reminiscent of when we studied the woman at the well. So you've got people at, at sort, sort of opposite ends of society in a manner of speaking. You have this woman who has had these husbands and so forth. She tried to distract Jesus also when he wanted to offer her the water of life. She tried her best to distract him, but he stayed right to the point uh, with her. And likewise with Nicodemus, he's coming. He think he, you know, he's a man of position. He is a man that's looked up to. He perhaps, you know, he's a Pharisee, but he quite likely uh, could have been part of the judicial system. I know mostly it was Sadducees that did that, but uh, there were some Pharisees in there as well. And so, uh, and his knowledge, he probably was very proud and people praised him for his knowledge and so forth. Oh, sure. So Jesus, you know, Jesus talks to him about the very things on which hangs his pride and on which hangs all that, his identity, that all that made him, him. He gets mm -hmm. right to the crux of the issue and he doesn't take many sentences to do that. He did that with oh. the woman at the well. He didn't take, he didn't give her a lecture for a few hours before he got around to the point as oh. to make your point with the position. And likewise here with Nicodemus, he didn't beat around the bush and take forever to get to the point. He honed right into the point, you know. Honed right in, uh, exactly. Ex exactly. And so, uh, and, and we do know that, you know, at the end, Nicodemus, uh, you know, he tried to defend him, you know, before the Sanhedrin. And, and then we also read that he was one of the ones that helped uh, when uh, Christ to take his body off the off the uh, cross and so forth. So it, it there was a transformation that occurred for her and there was a transformation that occurred for him. But it shows that God, that Jesus is no respecter of persons in terms of trying to help to a person to see, help us to see in our hearts what he sees in our hearts, because we can't see it. That's right. But he can. He but can. he can. Yeah. Um, well, uh, Nicodemus, uh, along with his fellow Jews, um, understood clearly that the Gentiles needed to be converted. Yeah. But they didn't think they did. <laughs> yeah. 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 They thought they were in like Flynn. Right. But right. no one is born saved, mm -hmm. regardless of their nationality or the church that they were raised in. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not saved because we were born into a Seventh-day Adventist family. Uh, that doesn't save us. Uh, no. We're only saved by Jesus himself when we accept him. And so mm -hmm. um, Nicodemus had no thought at all that he needed anything. Um, and this thing shocked him. You, you must be born again. You, you must. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Um, <laughs> well, they did have many wonderful advantages, uh, from their heritage all the way back to Abraham, many distinct mm -hmm. advantages. And, uh, Romans talks about that in Romans three, what advantage has a Jew? Uh, much in every way, mm -hmm. uh, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. But in and of itself, that's not enough. And Jesus told Nicodemus the unthinkable that he must be born again. Yeah. Wow. Mm. And he uh, also confronted him with his own spiritual ignorance. He said, you mean you're a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the rebuke must have been stunning. Uh, well, despite whatever questions he had regarding Jesus, Nicodemus later took his side with the followers of Jesus. Mm -hmm. and he helped with the burial of Jesus and, uh, mm -hmm. and so forth at the, uh, at the, after the cross. Well, uh, who do you think uh, Nicodemus thought was going to lead the discussion in that night visit? He thought he was. He was accustomed. <laughs> he was accustomed to that. You know, That's it was. Right. You know. <laughs> yeah, he thought he was going to be the leader, and boy, did he get a surprise! Well, yeah. uh, what does it mean to be born again, and why would Jesus put such emphasis on it? Well, as we've studied today, it's 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 not a natural rebirth; it's a spiritual birth. And uh, the reason it's such an emphasis, 
that's the only thing that brings salvation. Jesus said that you have to be born again or you will not enter the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, on Friday, we concluded our study. And we find that uh, Nicodemus, after that night visit, searched the scriptures in a new way. Not for the discussion of a theory, but in order to receive life for the soul. And he began to see the kingdom of heaven as he submitted himself to the leading of the Holy Spirit. I hope each of us were able to consider this passage, this chapter on Nicodemus and Desire of Ages, because it does this for each one of us as we as we read it. Uh, it enables us to submit ourselves to the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's what this chapter mm -hmm. essentially does. And uh, it's such a blessing to read it. Um, and so it's, it's through faith <clears throat> that we receive the grace of God. <clears throat> we uh, follow the leading of the Spirit and, and, and submit to the leading of the Spirit. But faith is not our Savior. That's right. It earns nothing. Now, that's a strong statement. You you think faith is a very important thing, and it is, mm -hmm. but, but it earns nothing. If I were to ask Zoe, what does it earn, Zoe? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it is the hand by which we lay hold upon Christ and appropriate his merits, the remedy for sin. Mm -hmm. So repentance comes from Christ as truly as does pardon. He initiates it all. So how then are we to be saved? It's by looking to that serpent on mm -hmm. the point, the Lamb of God. That's right. And the light shining from the cross reveals the love of God, and his love is drawing us to himself. And if we do not resist this drawing, we should be led to the foot of the cross in repentance for the sins that have crucified the Savior. And then the Spirit of God through faith produces a new life in the soul. In the soul, yes. So that is what this lesson is all about, making sure that we experience that. Amen. And if we got that from the study... We got the main point of all these witnesses that Jesus is the Son of God. He's our Savior. He's our Lamb. He's our sacrifice. He's our Savior. And he's our only hope. Heavenly Amen. Father, thank you so much for this beautiful study and all that it taught us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ray. That was a wonderful study. And friends, we just feel like we just barely, barely uh, scraped the surface of this uh, study. So we would encourage you to spend some time uh, really delving into this because these are uh, truths that truly, I mean, as all the studies have been, but in particular, as I had mentioned at the outset of these studies, uh, John, the book of John is just uh, such a book about the revelation of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. uh, as much as is re uh, uh, revelation. And I know all of the Bible really is a revelation of, of God. But uh, we do thank you so much for having joined us. We invite you to stay by on this channel for our worship service that will begin here in just a few minutes. Otherwise, join us uh, in person live. Uh, the choir, Pastor Ray is in our choir, and our choir is going to be singing today. And so we invite you to worship there uh, with us. In the meantime, we um, pray that you'll have a wonderful week, and we look forward then to our study with you next week, which is going to be uh, the testimony of the Samaritans. So that's going to be pretty wonderful. So we look forward to uh, that time uh, with you. So we'll say goodbye now and wish you a very happy Sabbath. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Mm -hmm. And recording.